All right, in our series of one word sermons, we've been looking really at the plan of salvation. Knowing that for the most part, we all know the plan of salvation. I guess you could say that this is uh, reminding you of some of these things. However, tonight what we're going to do is to consider some of the teachings that's out there on baptism and the error that's found in those teachings. So what we will do, we'll look at the error and then we'll look at the truth, what the Bible says. As we've talked so much about, there is a lot of error out in the religious world today. And the only way we can realize what's error in the truth is to know the truth. If we don't know the truth, well, then we are going to be, uh, it's going to be hard to ascertain the truth from the error. That's why you have so many different uh, beliefs today concerning baptism. One of the things that we read in 1 Corinthians 14 is that God is not the author of confusion. And we have all kinds of confusion today in the religious world as far as beliefs is concerned, and especially baptism. So what we want to do is to examine some of these uh, false teachings compared to the New Testament. First of all, there is a belief that uh, came out probably in the late 1800s, early 1900s. I can't remember for sure. I mean, I wasn't around back then, but uh, when I read this, it's, that's how far back it goes. It teaches that baptism was a part of the Jewish ceremonial system. So that when the law was abrogated, so was baptism. And the teaching goes on to say that the law was not abrogated until after the book of Acts was written. So therefore, after the book of Acts, baptism was done away with in the law. Well, is that... True or false? Well, we're going to show that it's false. First of all, the first error is to think that the law was not abolished until after the book of Acts. So we have to look at that first. When was the law abolished? Again, some repetition here, but uh, bear with me. In Galatians 3, 24 to 25, the Bible tells us the law was our tutor to bring us unto Christ. It was a schoolmaster, I believe is what the, the King James says, our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But once faith has come, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. Okay? So the law was going to be in effect until the coming of Christ. Well, when Christ came, it was before the writing of the book of Acts. Jesus completed the law, but it wasn't until the very end when He completed it. In Luke 24, 44, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. He was the fulfillment of the law. Remember Jesus promised in the very beginning of his ministry that not one jot, one tittle, which is the smallest of the Hebrew alphabet, the very smallest, not one of these little small marks will pass away until all things are fulfilled. Not destroyed, but fulfilled. He fulfilled them. In the fulfillment of the law, it is no longer uh, in uh, 
operation. It has been fulfilled and completed through Christ, perfected through Christ. After his death, when his blood was shed, the law changed. Matthew 26, verse 28, he told the disciples to take the fruit of the vine and drink. For this represents my blood, which is shed for the new covenant, the new testament, which is shed for the many for the remission of sins. But it represents the blood of the new covenant. He's emphasizing that his blood will usher in another covenant. That it will do away with the old covenant. The mosaical covenant. The mosaical system. Because it has been fulfilled. Hebrews 7 and verses 11 and 12. Therefore if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood. For under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek. And not be called according to the order of Aaron. Well, how could Jesus serve as a priest? Even under the order of Melchizedek. Because under the law, no one except those under Aaron could serve as priest or high priest. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is a change in the law. Verse 12. The law had to change in order for Jesus to serve as a priest. We talked about that in Joe's class Wednesday night a few months ago. That once Jesus became priest, the law had to change. Because nothing is said in the Mosaic law about anyone from the tribe of Judah serving in the priesthood. In fact, under the Moses law, the law of Moses, he would have been put to death. So with his becoming a priest, the law had to change. The law was terminated on the cross. Look at Ephesians 2, 15 and 16. Ephesians 2, 15 and 16. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. The word enmity has to do with enemy. That which is contrary to us, against us. That is the law of commandments. You see, the law of commandments was our enemy because it revealed the truth that we are all sinners. And basically, it trapped us in our sins. It just rolled forward our sins from one year to the next. It did not eliminate them. Only the blood of Christ could do that. So as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both, all about Jew and Gentile, to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. What is he saying? That which once stood against us, our enemy, the ones that locked us in the dungeon of sin, has now been eliminated through Jesus Christ. It's no longer against us. We haven't been under the law since the blood of Christ was shed on the cross. That's when it changed. As soon as the church was established in Acts 2, the law was changed. Jesus became the priest, the high priest. The law had to change. So we, at that time, began to serve under the new covenant, ushered in by the shedding of his blood. And that, too, my friends, was prior to the book of Acts being written. Colossians 2, verse 14, having wiped out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us, and he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. You know... Not only was that plaque that Pilate wrote, King of the Jews, on the cross, so was the law. Years ago, I mentioned this before, just to bring to your recollection, a man by the name of Billy Graham said 
that we were still under the Ten Commandments. If we are still under the commandments, then we are still to be offered sacrifices. We're still, we're still under the judicial laws of Moses and we're under the ceremonial laws of Moses. The law was nailed to the cross even with the Ten Commandments. Some said, well, the commandments have just been brought over into the new. Can't happen. Can't happen. We can't serve, again, them without serving the rest of the law. They're all tied into one. And they were all done away with on the cross. Acts was written after the death of Christ and after the law was abolished. Or else, there were two laws in effect. And we cannot serve two laws. The Bible talks about the law of faith and the law of Christ. One and the same. If the law of Christ is in effect, then we cannot serve the law of Moses. Or we are bound to two laws and that doesn't work. That's why once our nation gained its freedom, we're no longer under the English law. We became a law unto ourselves, to our own government, our own judicial system. We made our laws, not England. The same thing exists in a spiritual concept. Once Jesus Christ went to the cross, the law was nailed on that cross. We are no longer under that law. After that cross, we have been redeemed by His blood from that law. We will not serve, we cannot serve two laws. Notice in Paul's epistles that there are a number of passages that deals with baptism. And most of these were written either during the writing of the book of Acts or slightly afterward. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. Do you, know, do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death? Now notice, we're baptized into His death. How do we get into His death? Well, through baptism. Therefore, we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in the newness of life. Our baptism is connected with the death of Christ. In order for us to associate with the death and the burial of Jesus Christ, we must be baptized. Or else we have no association with it. Galatians 3, 27, For as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Are we going to be able to be saved outside of the body of Christ? The answer to that is, of course not. Well, how do we get into the body? Well, we're told by Paul. Unless we're baptized into Christ. When we're baptized into Christ, then we put Him on as a suit of new clothes. And we carry Him with us. Ephesians 4, verse 5, there is one baptism. You know, some people want to marry baptism with the Holy Spirit baptism and bring those two together and say they're, they're both important. No, not anymore. Not baptism with the Holy Spirit. There's not another baptism acceptable to God besides the baptism of the New Testament. Only that will get us into Jesus Christ. Colossians 2, verse 12, Buried with Him in baptism in which you also were raised with Him through faith in the working of God who raised Him from the dead. Buried with Him in baptism. If there's no baptism, then there's no way to enter into the kingdom. John 3, and verse 5, which the kingdom was established at His death, and then on the day of Pentecost it was official. 
Baptism is the way we enter into that kingdom. For as a body is one, has many members, but also the many members of that body, they are one body, so also is Christ. I hate it when I join two passages together like that or separate them. For by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. What is the body? We've talked about this at length. The church. The one body is the church. It's a body composed of many members. That's us. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into the same spirit or into the one spirit. So there's one baptism. And as I mentioned, John 3 verse 5, we're buried, we are baptized in water and the Spirit. Water is water. It doesn't stand for anything. It doesn't represent anything. It is literal. There's, in fact, this is a commentary on that very subject here in Colossians 2. Also, we're going to be looking at Titus 3, verse 5. There's another commentary on this. Baptism is for infants and small children. Can you believe what they put these children through? I have a picture of, a, of an infant. Well, he may have been about the size of Wade. I mean, Wade. Uh, Wyatt, little bitty guy. They had him sitting in a in a bird bath looking thing of cold water, and that priest was standing there dumping water on his head. And that little guy was screaming at the top of his lungs. First of all, is he going to remember that event? Well, it may traumatize him for a while, but after a while, he'll forget it. It'll mean nothing to him. It meant nothing to him right there except some crazy guy pouring water on his head and didn't wash his hair beforehand. You know, it meant nothing to him. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. It meant nothing to him for a number of reasons. Well, where do they get that idea? In Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, is where this comes from. In him you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, which you also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So what they do is they link baptism of verse 12 with circumcision in verse 11. Now, circumcision is done to infants, small children, about eight days old usually. But they don't do it there. They wait a little while longer before they do it, uh, the baptism part. So they said, since circumcision is for infants, therefore baptism must be for infants. They don't get the context of what Paul is saying. Circumcision is a putting off of the flesh. Baptism is a removal of the flesh. He uses circumcision as a symbol for baptism. He doesn't link them together. It's a symbol. In baptism, the filth of the flesh is removed and we gain a new life. We become new creatures, a new creation. We're cleansed. We're clean in the flesh. The old flesh has been put off. That's what it represents. It does not represent baptism at, for young people, young infants. Since baptism washes away sins, does a child sin? had a lady come up to me several years ago. She had a daughter that was about 15 years old. And the daughter 
was very mentally retarded. She's a sweet kid. She had the mind of about a four-year-old. The mother came up to me and said, you need to baptize my daughter. And this lady was not a member of the church. And I said, why? Because she's at the, of age. I said, no, she's not. She may be in body, but she's not in her mind. She is a child. She doesn't know sin. And she didn't. She's no different than a, a small child. And I refuse to baptize her. I'm sorry, I'm that away. Because, number one, I didn't want to traumatize this poor child. She got very angry at me. I was sorry. I tried to explain to her. The verse out of James 4, verse 17. To him who knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. This little girl didn't know. No more than a child knows. A young infant, even toddler knows. She said, you're judging. No, I'm not judging. You're judging. That's not what baptism is for. There's no doubt in my mind if that child were to die, she'd go straight to heaven. I wish my soul was as clear and as clean as hers. Well, she went down to the, another congregation there and the youth minister baptized her. I thought, what, what, a, what a travesty of the truth. What people will do just to, to uh, satisfy others. Since children cannot sin, since they don't understand sin, then why baptize them? You don't. I don't know what the age of accountability is. I, I think that's different for different young people. And I'm not going to pass a judgment on that. But I'm saying when you have an infant or a very small child, they don't need to be baptized. I, I saw on Facebook, and I don't do Facebook much anymore, but when I was on Facebook quite a bit, there was a picture of a young man being baptized. And all the parents are so proud of him. And the kid comes up here to the baptistry, not here, but where he was, and does a cannonball into the baptistry. Oh, he really knew what he's doing, didn't he? <clears throat> Pardon me. Seven years old, and he cannonballs into the baptistry. And everybody, ah! Oh. A travesty of the truth. Sprinkling is an acceptable mode of baptism since when? I have in my book, I have my book, I have in my library a book. The book was written about 1934. Oh, it's outdated. No, it isn't. It's still scripture. It's called The Gospel Plan of Salvation by T.W. Brents. It is a scholar's work. When you look at the word baptism, he has... 34 lexicons quoted in their definition of baptism. In those 34 lexicons, some of them I was familiar with, some of them I wasn't. In those 34 lexicons, every single one of them defined baptism as an immersion. He had 36 scholars listed Men who'd done nothing but study the scriptures. Had them under a microscope. Every one of them said baptism was by immersion. Here is the strange thing about that. 
those scholars that said it was by immersion included Martin Luther. How about that? Also, John Calvin. These are the fathers of some of the denominations that's out there today. And yet, in their writings, they heralded baptism by immersion. In the New Testament, there are three words that I want to bring your attention to. Only because these words are so different. The first word, where it is? I thought. Oh, there it is. The very bottom paragraph in this in this uh, uh, slide. Two words are used for sprinkling. Proscusis, and the second word is rentizo. These words are always, always translated sprinkling. None of them are used ever in the plan of salvation. Acts 2.38, it is the word baptizo, immersion. Anywhere you see the word baptism, it's for immersion. It would be unscholarly. It would be going against everything that, that scholarship stands for to slip in sprinkling on Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16, Galatians 3.27, all these passages. Because the word is baptizo, which is always to be translated baptism. Not sprinkling. Had sprinkling been allowed, it would have been translated into that. It's not. Romans 6 verse 4. Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Huh. Baptism is a burial. Sprinkling is not a burial. Sprinkling is like throwing a little bit of water on a ca a little bit of uh, dirt on a casket. That's not an immersion of that uh, casket in the earth. That's not a burial. A burial is a complete immersion. In Acts chapter eight, when Philip and the eunuch was discussing Christ in his chariot. He said, see, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Number one, he knew it was water baptism. Had no doubt about it. Philip said, nothing if you truly believe. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now watch this. They both went down into the water. And they both came up out of the water, rejoicing. Philip went one way and the eunuch went another. But they went into the water. John the Baptist was at Anon. Why? Because there's much water there. Why do they need much water? If it was sprinkling, they could just use a Dixie cup. No. They had to have much water because they practiced baptism, immersion, total immersion. And there weren't children that they were immersing. Colossians 2, 12. Buried with him in baptism, in which also you were raised through faith and working of God. Another one is baptism, and this is pretty popular today. Baptism is just a symbol of salvation. There is a confession that is made in the baptistry by many denominations. I believe that Jesus Christ, for God's sake, hath saved me from my sins. That confession is made prior to one's baptism. In other words, you're saved first. Then a symbol, of that a symbol of that salvation is baptism. My question is, if you're saved outside of baptism, why would you want to put yourself through baptism? Why do they require it? I've heard, well, it's important, but it's not essential. Well, if it's not 
essential, then why do it? I don't get it, folks. I'll never get it. I'll tell you right now, if it's not essential, I'm not going to do it. Well, it is essential. It's for remission of sins. Notice Matthew 28, 19. Go on to and, be, and preach the gospel, making disciples of all nations. Through baptism, we make disciples of all nations. That's part of what baptism does. We become a disciple of Christ in baptism. For the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. Be baptized for the remission of sins. Repent be baptized. To wash away sins, Acts 22, verse 16. Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, Saul was told. In 1 Peter 3, 21, it's an answer to good conscience toward God. I want to tell you something. You know what this passage tells me? Outside of baptism, there's no answer to good conscience toward God. Because we are guilty. We're guilty of sin. The only way we can do anything about those sins is have them washed away. And if we refuse to do that, then we don't have a good conscience before God. Any attempt to spiritualize the water will water down God's grace. Some say it's just a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Well, I've already showed it's literal. John 3, verse 5. It's water. Oh, here's, here's one that really gets me. It's a work of human merit. I've been told, well, you're trying to work your way into heaven, having all these people baptized. Well, first of all, it's a divine command from God. In Acts 10, 48, a man by the name of Cornelius that we all know, first Gentile convert. Well, first of all, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, just like the apostles were on the day of Pentecost. To show that he had received God's grace just like those on Pentecost, he began to speak in tongues. Now, that was more for a sign for the Jews that was with Peter. It wasn't for Cornelius. And it wasn't for, stay with me, it was not for the remission of sins. It was to show the Jews and Peter that he was acceptable to God's grace. Look at verse 48. Acts 10. And he, talking about Peter, commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. By the authority of the Lord, he commanded them. He said, okay, we'll wait three months and then we're going to baptize you, but you've been saved by now. The Holy Spirit just saved you, so we don't need to be uh, baptizing you. That's not what he said. We command you by the authority of Jesus Christ to be baptized. That authority came from the Lord, not Peter. Their salvation wasn't completed until they had been baptized. That baptism of the Holy Spirit didn't even do it. It couldn't. Because you see, the plan of salvation doesn't include baptism of the Holy Spirit. It includes baptism by water. God made no exceptions to that rule. He still doesn't. Not by works of righteousness, but by the washing regeneration. You see, works of righteousness will be meritorious. That's not how He saved us. But according to His mercy, He saved us. Watch this. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Put John 3, 5 right there. Or put this with John 3, 5. You know, make a little note in your Bibles. The washing of regeneration stands for the water. That's how He saves us. Through water. And the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Not baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
but through the word of God. Now, bury them in baptism to which you were also raised with him through faith. Watch this. In baptism, we're raised through faith. Baptism is a work of faith. It's an act of faith in the working of God. Baptism is God working to save us. But on our part, it's an act of faith. Does that sound like meritorious works to you? Does that sound like someone's trying to work their way into heaven when they're being baptized? Because baptism is commanded. And because God is working through baptism. <coughs> well, it's not necessary to understand the purpose of baptism. Well, then let's baptize all the babies. If we don't have to understand what's going on. You know, a lot of times churches will accept people in their fellowship that had no clue about their baptism. I've asked people, why were you baptized? I don't know. Just thing to do. Why were you baptized? Well, you know, my parents were all baptized and I thought I needed to also. Why were you baptized? Well, to join the church. All of these are wrong answers. And by the way, understand church. We don't join the church. We're added to the church. That's a significant point out of Acts 2. Verse 42. God adds us to the church. If it's necessary to understand that Jesus died for us, if we don't get that, nothing else matters. This is my blood shed for the many for the remission of sins. My blood of the new covenant shed for the many for the remission of sins. And if, if we don't get that, we don't get it. Again, for the remission of sins, it's the same structure as Acts 2.38 as we talked about the other night. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. We have got to understand when a person goes into these baptismal waters, they have got to understand, first of all, that they are a sinner. That they have sinned. That their sins have condemned them. Secondly, they've got to understand that Jesus Christ died for their souls. That Jesus Christ shed His blood to purchase their souls. Thirdly, they've got to understand that baptism remits those sins from their life. That they stand before Him whole as a result of their baptism. Without an understanding of that, a proper understanding of that, baptism is just a dunking. Now we may not have to know everything in the Bible. Some people are wrong in thinking that you have to have a a pure understanding of God's Word and everything about the... No, you don't. Those are the things you need to know. But then you need to grow. This isn't some formula that we, we once we're baptized, and some people think it is, that we've done it all. Hey, God, take me. I'm ready. I've been baptized. We're not pew sitters, folks. There's more to do. There's more to come. Baptism is the new birth. That means we've got a lot of growing to do. We have to grow in our knowledge. We grow in our life. If we're not growing, what happens? If I stop growing in my body, that means I'm dead. I've died. Can a person be baptized in error and still please God. No. We can't be baptized 
for the wrong reason, God be pleased. Tonight, I hope that maybe we have seen how important baptism is in our lives. As I mentioned, as I mentioned, it's a new birth. It's just the beginning of our new walk. So tonight, and I want you to think, first of all, have you been baptized into Christ Jesus? Forgetting all the error that's out there, have you done what the Bible teaches? Have you been baptized? Have your sins washed away? Being able to give a good conscience before God? If not, here's your opportunity. Are you living your life like you've been baptized? Is your life representing the new birth? And here's a key question. Are you growing? Are you growing in the Word? Are you growing in your life, in your character? Are you growing? If you have any kind of decision to make tonight and choose to make it, we'd encourage you to come while we stand and sing together.